That's uh, that's working okay. Well, um, as I say, this is supposed to be the uh, the FIBO uh, meeting. So uh, first of all, is anybody doing some research that uh, you might like to talk about? Uh, look at the inquiries coming in. I have to be honest. Um, I got one that came in the other day. Uh, interesting chat. You know, I thought, oh, okay. Um, initially, he told me the wrong regiment, but I sort of went back to him and said, oh, you know, uh, the regiment that you were talking about, they were in Salon. He said, oh, no, sorry. He said, I've got it wrong. It's the 7th Coast Regiment. So I thought, I know that one. That's one my father was with. Um, so I get this guy's POW card, you know, big red line through it. Oh, hello. <laughs> so you look at the back. And um, he was on the Rakio Maru. And he was picked up by USS Sea Lion. So this is why this guy wanted probably to know a little bit more about the regiment his dad was with. But uh, yeah, he uh, he came home. He was one of the lucky ones. I met a met an Australian bloke that was that got picked up by the US. Yeah. And he uh, was in the same unit as my father. And he, uh, when they picked him up, they took him, brought him back here via Guadalcanal. Yeah, right. It was a horrific turn out. Yeah, this guy um, was debriefed at uh, in Newcastle, Newcastle on Tyne, Fullerton Barracks. Yeah, I was he. Yeah. Hmm? Jeez. Yeah. They took him right back to the UK. Um, eventually, yeah, initially, they, they took him to Saipan, um, which is where the subs were based. or they, That's where the nearest hospital was. So they took him to Saipan. Ah. Um, and from there, I think they came to San Francisco on the USS Marine Shark. Oh, yeah. And then from San Francisco back to the, back eventually to the UK. Um, and it was interesting because the guys that came back, they were asked, not told, not ordered, asked, not to say anything. Yeah. Obviously, there's still people in uh, in Japanese hands and all the rest of it. And two of them yeah. disobeyed that disobeyed that request. And there's some interesting pattern. This may be why you had this guard your tongue notice. Mm. POW yeah. came home and the army said right okay we've got to court martial these two guys and the army council said on what grounds you didn't order them you requested you can't touch them so that was how it was left I believe well this yeah. this fella that I met he since passed on when he came back, he was back in Australia before Christmas 1944. Wow. And he was on leave. Uh, he lived out in the western part of New South Wales, out of a place called Hay, which is hot, dry and bloody, you know, flat as the ace of anything. And uh, uh, he was home and then all of a sudden, he was after a few weeks, he got an urgent telegram that he had to go to Sydney and then they went to Sydney to Liverpool. And then he was taken from there to Melbourne. And then he was interrogated. And he said it was quite horrific because he, there were that many requests there of him to, from relatives trying to find out about next of kin that were, mm. were prisoners of war. And he said it was a, quite a, you know, horrific thing to go through because they were asking him about different, did you remember this fella, did he? You remember that bloke? You remember this bloke? When did he die? You know, and this sort of thing. So uh, he was telling me all about it. But he uh, he drifted, I think, for about 36 hours when the boat went down. And before he was rescued. But, uh, my father, he went to Japan on the, the ration Maru. And that was a 70-day journey. Uh, including 22 days dropped anchor in Manila Bay. So that was far from pleasant too. Yeah. Mm. So that's, 
people that came back on the US Marine Shark. And, and when was that, Keith? Was was that before the war ended? Yes. Yeah, they were they were back in the UK. I think early 1945. That would have been about the time right, of VE yeah, Day. Okay. You know, I, I think I'd, I'd have to look it up for you, Tom. Um, it may have been towards the end. Yeah, no, no problem. No, no, just uh, you know, were, were they being were, were people being repatriated? At, you know, before the end of the war, rather than yeah, you know, no. rather than waiting. Yeah, these guys were because I think part of their information from their debrief Anthony Eden used to address Parliament as to what was actually happening to the Far East and yeah. the, the guys who were uh, captured in the Far East. Um, and I know one chap, I've got his report here, and he was with my father's party that went up on the railway. So I now, I know how they got to where they got to on the railway and all the rest of it. So it's a Staff Sergeant Jones, I think it was. And he's a, it was a very, very good report. And it, it filled in a lot of detail for me. You know, it's just one of these things you fall over. Like, oh, yeah. This looks interesting. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, they were debriefed in two. Air. One, one debrief took part in Newcastle. And I'll have to look up the paperwork to see where the other one was. There were two, two centres. Uh, Newcastle being the main one, I believe. But of course, they were then asked. Tell, tell me, Keith, the, that, uh, the numbers at the top of the repatriation form, do they follow any sense or, or are they very <laughs> haphazard? That's a good question, Tom. I don't know. I would have thought, in theory. Yeah, because uh, these are the. Um, um, uh, the Far East ones, uh, and they're, they're all, you know, I'm just wondering if they, if you could tell by the number whereabouts they were interrogated, where the whereabouts they were filled in. Because certainly the, the people that I've got uh, that were repatriated to New Zealand and Australia, the Australian lads that were on board Exeter, they were all interrogated by an officer and a typed up report made. Um, but the, of course the lads that came back the, the the British lads that came back on on Maidstone were just given a sheet of pencil and a, and a pencil, sheet of paper and a pencil. Sorry, and yeah. told to get on with it. And as soon as they finished, they could go. Um, so, you know, the, the, that's why the minimal um, information on, on the repatriation forms, uh, as opposed to what everybody was looking for, what we are still looking for. Well, I think. Oh, I just wondered if there was any coming from a, 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 any order of what of where where the numbers came from. That's all. No, I don't know. It's on that. Like, I wish I could answer that one. I don't know. But we know there are about a hundred or so liberation questionnaires no, uh, in New Zealand. Because uh, yep. took them right to New Zealand. Mate, well, these That's guys amazing. These guys were um, went to New Zealand on a hospital ship. To, to build themselves up before they started the journey home. Yeah. Uh, Michael Peth My father was in D Force on the railway. Yep. Uh, 2,200 Australians and 2,800 British. Do you know what um, what work group he was in at all? Or? He was in S Battalion. This is the big thing, isn't it? There's, there's not. There's only about 4,000 Australian POW cards. And they found those in Tokyo. Yeah. Well, I forget, I forget when they found yeah. 2007, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know. Yeah, I've got his. Oh, yeah, baby. All oh, right. Because Rob Beatty turned around and said, well, that's great. You know, where's the rest? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, where the rest of them are. That there's, like, the blokes that were sand darkened. They'd have none of theirs because it was such an horrific uh, war crime there. They would have destroyed it. We have cards of Brits who died at Sandarkham. And all of the Borneo cards have no information at all apart from a stamp. And this stamp basically says, we don't know what happened to these guys because the POW captain never told us. 
and this is the prison wall yeah, yeah. in Tokyo. And there's obviously a number of them because it's a stamp across the across the card. Um, I was yeah, yeah. one the other day. Two guys, or two brothers, who died uh, at um, Labuan. They were on the airfield party, um, and their card has the same stamp. It doesn't say they died. There's not, nothing on the card at all. There's this stamp, and there is a date, and that's the date they arrived in Kuching. And that's it. Nothing yeah. else at all. Yeah, well, Dad, Dad went from uh, Changi to the Great World POW camp in Singapore, and then he went up on the railway line, and then when he came back, he went to... Uh, Nakasaki 2B, and then he went to Fukuoka 21 at Nakama, which is the coal mine. And from that, that's where he finished the war. Most, <clears throat> most of the exit lots that went up, were, uh, went up to Nagasaki were in either 2B or 26B, working either on yeah. the dockyard or in the uh, yeah, that was 26B, it was a coal mine. Yeah, and bloody coal too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did from from reports from talking to them that they, they found that they, it was a nice sky because the, the Japanese couldn't make them couldn't see them not working. Oh, uh, well, Dad said he'd be up to his waist in water in the mines. And he said in the shipyards, he said that was another story. That was bloody uh, pretty, you know, pretty hard work and in very cold <coughs> conditions. It was so the, the Japanese have never been very safety conscious. Even even today's no. Japanese workforce, so they're, they're not very safety conscious. So it'd be even worse then. Well, some of the mines have been condemned anyway. Well, they had been. That's right. Before the yeah. war. Yeah. That's exactly right. The one Dad was in, I think, was one of them. Yep. But I never realised, too, that there were about 120 to 130 POW camps in Japan itself. Oh, crumbs, yeah, stacks them. Oh, yeah, yeah. It makes you wonder whether Japan, how, you know, Japan isn't that big. How they managed to fix it. Well, the 26, yeah. 27 down on the, on the island that Nagasaki's on. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. But anyway, plus all I, the ones that uh, are in the, the outside Tokyo. I uh, um, didn't get any idea about what they went through until I went to Thailand, and that gave me a better understanding. Hmm. Because coming from the bush in Australia, and where my father came from, and he'd tell you all about it, but you didn't have a bloody clue what he was talking about. Had no idea whatsoever. We did. Seeing about you know when when you seen the company we part read it from uh, Japan and they went to Manila. Did they spend some time in Manila or but they virtually put on a ship straight out or? Yeah, from what I from what I've read, Kevin, I think they spent some time in Manila. Dad spent a week at Manila. Mm -hmm. I think it. Uh, From from what I've picked up of the um, uh, lads that came out of Nagasaki to go down to Manila and um, back on the um, ships going across to the states, uh, they just they were waiting uh, just for a, a ship, and uh, I think there was a, a ship leaving just about every day. Looking at the dates, um, just about a ship every day going from Manila up to the west coast of the states. Well, Dad, uh, 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 various descriptions. Yeah, because I was just, uh, I've been doing some work on uh, the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers repatriations uh, from Japan. And uh, Jimmy Walker, whose book uh, uh, of racing men, he was in um, Uruguay. And uh, they, most of them came back on the um, HMS Implacable. But there was a couple of yep. guys who were in the same camp as him, but he come back on a different ship. And I was thinking, well, why was that? And I, it look, I was look, just looking at that. It, it looks like them two guys decided to stay in Manila a bit longer, and the rest of them went on implacable, yeah. and they, they come back on the next ship. So there was that a good time in Manila, I think. 
So talking about the uh, repatriation, the, but the Manila's still a good place to have a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah especially after being in the prison of war camp. Yeah, <laughs> but seeing about the um, the re their, their lists I've done, I've, I've actually put them on the Roddy's um, you know, the well, shared hard drive, uh, shared one drive. The oh, repatriation yeah. ships, the repatriation lists of the uh, Roland O'Thumbler Fusiliers is on there, but I did a one for the Exeter as well. A couple of the ships that uh, I could find, so that's that's on the one drive as well. And I also did that I, um, the first the first uh, draft from uh, the Dodge Camp in Pelabang, the first draft that they took the uh, men from Pelabang back to Singapore. The the list of that's on there as well. That's the three three um, Excel spreadsheets. So that I hope more than thirty point to have a look at. That's you, you you mentioned the the implacable there. She was, uh, she yeah. was an aircraft carrier. And they yeah. dumped the airplanes over the side to make room in the hangars yeah. for all the beds that they were putting in. Yeah, yeah. Just think about all that. Which all the stuff that they made for the war would then become redundant. Yeah. Well, they said the Americans do the aircraft. Right? Uh, no. some, some people say it was dumped over the side. Other people said it was dumped down in Australia. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to have to bow out now. Okay, okay how about... Here. Yeah. I'm still getting used to using this type of technology with people with a different accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll have to get a translator. Other time delay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'll contact you next time. Okay, take okay. care, Howard. All the very Cheers best Howard. Team. Cheers now. Bye. And I hope that things can improve for you in that part of the world because it's it's very, very worrying for you people. Yeah. Thank you. And all the best yeah. to you. Okay, Howard. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Howard. Cheers, Take Howard. Care. Yeah. So you've got uh, Jeff on there. Jeff, are, Just can you hear us? Before you came on there, on yeah. the um, just mentioned it before you came on there, Keith. The uh, got one of the things from VJ Day. Uh, the granddaughter was going through the uh, granddaughter's photos, and he left Macassar uh, to go across to Cycle Camp. And got reported on the uh, the same ship as uh, Cecilia was it? Or Cilica, Cilica, something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, but he ended up in the uh, Royal Naval Auxiliary Hospital at Newton Abbott um, that I'd never heard of. Uh, put queries out left, right and centre and the Newton Abbott Museum has come back to say yes, there was a uh, Royal Naval Hospital there. Can you give us more details about it? I said, well, I'm asking you for details. Um, but the volunteer that came back is a poorhouse expert. And it, the, the Naval Hospital was the old poorhouse, uh, right in the centre of Newton Abbey. Uh, but he says, we've got no pictures. And ask if there's any pictures. Send this picture back, uh, this photograph back of the six or seven ex six or seven nurses and the nursing sister. They've traced the nursing sister back to working for the Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service. But of course, all the nurses were uh, voluntary aid detachment, VADs, uh, and there's no records of them. But the um, lady that's searched going into the files of the Queen Alexandra's Naval Nurse, Nursing Service, she's very hopeful about being able to identify the actual sister that's in the photo. So mm -hmm. it, well, oh, that's good. making a little bit of progress. Time, time consuming. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't even know there was a, a Royal Naval Auxiliary Hospital. I didn't even know they existed. Hmm. Right, more Jeffrey. Old news and old stuff. Okay, Jeff. No, I can't, we can't hear you. Your mic's not on, Jeff. Is your microphone on?
That's better. Yeah, it's off. Yeah, we can't hear you, Jeff. Can you hear us okay? <laughs> Reboot. Yeah, the, the, the classic <laughs> game. Doesn't sound like it. Turn it off and turn it back on again. That's all. All this works. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll just tell you what I've been up to. Um, I'm looking at how uh, Thailand got involved with the Second World War and looking at uh, sort of from 1932, really, when there was a revolution in, um, in Thailand where the monarchy changed from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional one and as, as a matter of fact i don't know if you've uh, been following what's going on in thailand at the moment but there, there's been for the last fortnight there's been quite a number of riots well not riots that, that's that's wrong protests um involving tens of thousands of uh, students and younger people who are um balking against the monarchy and the prime minister they want three things to change. They want the prime minister to resign. Um, they want the uh, the king to um, uh, reform. And um, what was the other one? I can't remember the third one. But but there's quite a lot going on. And when you when you look back, it goes right back to 1932 when they had this uh, revolution. And and since then, they've had um, 12 prime ministers and something like 10 coup d'etats where you know one side doesn't like the other and they have a revolution so what 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 what's interesting me is is how how thailand was an ally of uh, of, of uh, great britain and, and europe and, and america leading up to the second world war and how things changed um so i've been i've been going back looking at the monarchy in the absolute era and uh, i've got this wonderful book it's called um siam and world war one all oh, right yeah and I, I bought it when i was in in thailand um just 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 because i saw it and i thought i'm interested in this you know it, it's quite expensive but it, it's full of photographs of uh, you know going going right back and it and it, it goes right through what happened with with thailand and how it got involved with world war one they sent over 1200 troops to um to fight um it was towards the end of the war it was in in 1918 in june 1918 so they were right at the, the back end but it's significant because they thailand as a country then got onto the international scene and following the war, they they had because they had participated and and uh, 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 declared which side they were on. They um, they they came onto the international table, and that's how it started. We're getting um, more trade deals, more um, education, more social deals with uh, with Europe and America, and that's how they became allies. So I'm looking at how what changed you know in in, uh, in the lead up to the second world war um and and hopefully get involved with matador operation matador which i know is controversial and some of you guys have probably got views on it and, and information as well but uh, and then through the war um, we we know that thailand was uh, was a de facto ally of, of japan but what happened after the war as well because Kind of by the end of the war, Thailand was on the side of the Allies, <laughs> so it, it, they were in a unique position. Really, they started being on being on the wrong side and ended up being on the right side. And um, it's all about the process of what what happened to them and and how they uh, how how they came out of it because they did come out of it. They were very keen to maintain their nationality, 
They didn't want to get involved with any colonial power and they wanted to maintain the neutrality as well. So it was all very delicately balanced. So I've been looking at that and it's, it's really, really interesting, this book. It's, um, uh, it was well worth uh, carrying in the rucksack as heavyweight, uh, oh, <laughs> heavyweight baggage. So that's what I'm up to. <laughs> um, one thing where I came across it, but I know the Americans told Churchill in no uncertain terms to leave Thailand alone. Because Churchill wanted to invade Thailand at the end of the war. And uh, the Americans told him in no uncertain terms to just leave, leave one alone, thank you. Yeah, I think there was... Um, and, he, and he had to do as he was told. Yeah, there, there was a, <clears throat> a bit of a fear that... Um, Great Britain would colonize Thailand. Yeah. Because uh, Thailand had allowed Japan to use their country to invade Malaya and, and Burma. And of course, you know, we lost lost those colonies. And there's, there's some sort of recompense at the end of the war in the peace treaties that uh, Britain wanted, um, or it was feared that Britain would colonize Thailand. Um, and there, there was peace agreements that um, because Great Britain and Thailand were officially at war with each other. Um, and, and when the peace agreements were, uh, or treaties were um, were drawn up, the first one that Britain drew up was very much in favour of Britain and, and not in favour with Thailand. And I think America stepped in at that point and... Uh, uh, in fact, I think it was about to be signed and the Americans hadn't even seen it. You know, there, there was uh, it was that close to being signed, um, but yeah, there was uh, there was a lot of argy bargy going on at the end of the war between uh, Britain and Thailand and how it how it all ended up. So, uh, but I think that's an area that's not been looked at, you know, because quite rightly, lots of people are looking at Thailand as where the prisoners of war were kept and what happened to them and and the prison camps and and so on, but there's a tendency to forget what was happening underneath the surface in, in, in Thailand and, um, you know, the results of it all at the end of the war. Interesting. So that's keeping me quiet in the lockdown. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see, Jeff, can you, can you hear us now? No, uh, we can't hear you, too. Jeff. Take your, your, your microphone's on, but we can't hear you. Can you write in the notes? Yeah, his microphone's on. Are you on your mobile phone, Jeff? Yeah. I'll be Nope. Yeah. Any good lip readers around? Yeah. Right. Again. Uh, technical problems. Oh. <laughs> I know the. Uh, I'm just going to say the. Uh, you know, we all like always get books and all that. You know the. Um, and we all. I'm probably the same as you, so I've got like a load of books on the shelf. Uh, but my son bought is one of them. It's like a Kindle type of thing. And I thought I would try a couple of the books that I've got. And uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite impressed with it, actually. Ah, yeah. oh, it's a good book, that one. Yeah, I'm quite, impre I'm quite impressed with it. It's, 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 it's pretty easy to use. Mm. But it's got a great feature on it. It actually reads the book to you if you want to. 
Mm. So you can put the headphones on, just let, 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 let the book read it to you, which is, I thought was a good, uh, good feature. <laughs> But I'm quite impressed with it actually because you, you can actually, you know, like uh, really, I've got I've got your book on there as well, and uh, all the maps and stuff like that. You can actually blow them up and things like that. Which I, I thought that was a quite a good uh, feature of that. Mm. As I say, it's great having the books on the bookshelf. I, I've always liked that, but I thought, well, I'll give that a go. Uh, as I say, I'm quite quite impressed with that. Now. What's the name of the uh, device? It's a, it's actually an Amazon. It's an Amazon right. Fire, they call them. It's 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 yeah. a bit about the same size as a Kindle. Yeah. So basically, you've got like a paperback book size, if you like. Yeah. Does it do anything else apart from... Oh, yeah. You can, you can browse the internet and stuff like that. It's yeah. like, just like, a, um, like an iPod, if you like. Yeah. But yeah. it's not as powerful as that, obviously. Hmm. Yeah, because there's, uh, there's so many books out at the moment, it's it's pretty hard to keep up with them all. Oh, oh yeah, I'm I'm going through uh, John Tark's book, Borneo Graveyards. <laughs> that's a bit depressing, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, that's the title of it, but it's covering the whole of the war in Borneo, uh, Dutch Borneo, and British North Borneo. And. I must admit, I'm just absolutely gobsmacked by some of the stuff that John's uncovered. Um, I didn't realise things were so bad for the civilians, like the, the, the local population in Borneo. I mean, the Japs were doing, a, were doing numbers yeah. on the civilians. And these, these are supposed to be the people they've come to liberate. Um, mm. And evidently it was so bad so when the Japanese surrendered to the Australians, they were told to march to a particular particular area. The local headhunters and tribes decided they'd get some of their own back, and eight thousand Japanese were killed. Wow. On that march. Hmm. Uh, yeah. But you know, I mean, you see, I'm just just at the start of 19 or middle of 1943 at the minute and we've we've got the uh, the party being taken out Kuching to Labuan that's the 200 men from there um, some of the men from Sendakan being sent to Jesseltown um, and um, the camp there and they were lucky they were they were actually moved out because anybody that was left there didn't survive because you had the death marches and then the camp was destroyed but yeah it's it's um it's, it's an eye opener this one okay, yeah. is that how how did eight thousand japanese soldiers die were they murdered or yeah. starved or how oh, they were murdered wow local tribes got got hold of them Good that. So the rest of it, because evidently head hunting was still still right <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, 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 i know it's a good lord, 8,000. But um, see what the tribes getting any help from us. Rife. It's still rife there now. Hmm? I'm sorry, Keith, were the, were the, were the uh, local tribes weren't getting help from uh, from the Allies, or, or they just did it on their own back? Or? On their own back, from, from what I understand, but I've, I've got to get to that. I'm not, I'm, you know, it's just something that I, I happen to pick up, but uh, as I'm going through the book, I'll, I'll probably find out some more. I mean, there's a very interesting book. Um, if, if anybody's interested enough to get hold of it, or you can even get hold of it on your um, Amazon tablet, uh, called Batten's Samurai. What's it called, Keith? Sorry? Batten's Samurai. And then the author again, what? sorry. Um, I'll find out for you, Ray, and drop your line. Drop your line. Thanks. I'll go, I'll go downstairs in a minute to find it. Um, and it answers a lot of questions. One of them being why the Japanese never paid the British any compensation. Mm. Now, when um, Japan surrendered, they, the 
Japanese troops were known as Japanese surrendered personnel. I think the only POWs, the Japanese, the Japanese POWs, were those awaiting war crimes trials. And of course, um, the Japanese surrendered personnel were used to tidy up Singapore and places like that. They actually fought on the side of the British in Java, fought the, um, mm. the Indians. Uh, likewise, in French Indochina, Vietnam, we didn't have enough boots on the ground. And the big bone of contention is that these people were never paid for their labour. Now, they should have been. If they were POWs, they would have been paid. And it was at the conference, I think, in this San Francisco conference, where the British realised that they were going to have to pay a heck of a lot of money to Japan or try and wiggle out of it. And basically what happened, it was agreed that there would be no claims made against any party. So the British got away with not paying any money over to the Japanese for the work these guys had done. And the Japanese got away with not giving any compensation hmm. to the British government at the time. Hmm. Interesting. But adding on to that case, the uh, down at Mikasa, the Australians came in initially um, just after VJ Day uh, when they found out that Mikasa existed. But they um, they re-employed the Japanese forces to now protect the prisoners from the locals because when the Dutch were, were that was going to be the, the, the next civil war 45 to 47 yeah. um, but the, the started fighting against the Dutch already as soon as the as soon as the Japanese stopped fighting then but the, the Australian forces gave rearmed the Japanese guards to look after the prisoners rather than to keep them prisoner. Yeah. So it, it was right through until uh, when Mukasa surrendered uh, officially, uh, 22nd, 23rd September. Um, th that intervening six weeks what was when the, the prisoners were guarded by the Japanese against the, against the locals. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I can, I can see where that's coming from. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the Japanese were used. Of course, they they would they they would for it. Hmm. Um, they, they were used in Java and Sumatra to fight the Indonesians, and actually there was one Japanese battalion. And there was a photo yep. on Facebook of a major. I think it's Major Kido, K I D O, and he was actually put forward for an MBE. <laughs> For all the all the help he gave the British, but that was very subtly turned down. <laughs> um, but no, I mean that, that it got to a point where they very subtle, very subtle. Uh, they, um, if you like, rebadged the Japanese aircraft with the Siak Rambles, and Japanese pilots were fighting the Indonesians, bombing the Indonesians using their own aircraft, albeit under you know with the, with the Siak Rambles on. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots going on. It's, it's a very, very interesting book. In actual fact, let me just whip downstairs and see if I can get it for you. Mm. I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, disappear. The dogs are lining up. I mean, uh, I'll, um, I'll have a look at the recording when we finish. Do you? Are you intending going on for much longer? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll, it'll be. Uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Ronnie, and then, okay. then he puts it up onto the Facebook. Okay. Okay, Tom. Okay. See, hey. Cheers now, lads. <laughs> See you later. Uh, take Bye, care. Tom. Bye. Cheers now. Bye bye. Bye. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>
it does look like yeah, Jeff's not very much look. No, he's uh, persevering. Right, Mountain Patton's Samurai. By Stephen B. Connor. Stephen Connor. Yeah, Stephen B. Connor. C O N N O R. Hmm. Is it a new book or? Um... Um, Two thousand and fifteen. Oh, right. Here it is. You can see it. Just lift it up a bit, Keith. Ah, that look, it's quite a hefty tone. I think this was done as part of a university study that this guy was doing. He's doing. Um, like a PhD or something. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. There's so much to look at, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> Could have to get a bigger shelves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's a couple of other books that I've I've seen have come out, and I thought, oh, I, I might get hold of those, but I haven't at the moment. So I'll, I think it was one that came out. I think it was it was published on or, or mentioned on Facebook. I think it was called Crushed Flower or something like that, but you're looking at comfort women. Oh, right. I think a number of Dutch ladies that were used as comfort women, and it was their story. Mm. Um, but uh, I saw it, but I've not, uh, not picked it up. Yeah, there's, there's so much to look at. There is. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> Wait, Jeff, have, I you, think... have you got sorted, Jeff? No. No. <laughs> it must be a mute on your phone, I think. Because <laughs> yeah, the microphone is on here at this end. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll see you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got. Uh... So he called, called the help desk. Yeah, yeah, he's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, talking of books, I mean, I think um, your idea with the Amazon um, uh, tablet type of thing is is great, but there's nothing like having the old books, is there? You know, uh, yeah, sort of 40, 30, 40, 50 years old. You know, I've, I've got one here that I'm researching with. Um, by Sajaya Crosby, uh, Siam the Crossroads. Uh -huh. And uh, so Josiah, it's hard to say Sir Josiah Crosby, <laughs> was the foreign minister in Bangkok at the time the, um, the Thais declared war on, on, uh, on, on Great Britain. And so he was there, you know, he was in the diplomatic um, circles leading up to the war and, and this is his first-hand account that was written in 1944 so it's not even at the end of the war you know it, it was uh, what was going on in the middle and i've got another one here i think i showed it last time um oh, how no. strong is japan by noel barber and this was written in 1942 just after um the japanese had um gone into thailand and just after pearl harbor and it, it's an account broken down um broken down into sections um if I just get the index by the navy the uh, japanese navy um the army the air strength um defenses economic industry the men you know it, it's quite it's quite interesting but um i think it was a book of its time you know yeah, when you yeah. when you sort of read it now you think well but um Noel Barber, the same author that wrote Sinister Twilight, and, uh, and um, he was a, an acclaimed journalist, so he had access to these to this information somehow, um, and, it, and he'd been to a lot of places in in Japan uh, and, and China. So, but the, those books are great. But the the the, um, the tablet idea is good for the new books, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, 
Yeah, as I say, for, for maps and stuff like that, I think it's great. You now you can just blow them up and yeah, you get the you get all the detail. It, it, you might actually not be able to see properly on the on a, on a page. You know, right, that's, that's yeah. quite good. Yeah, that was something I was going to you, you just just mention it, like you know about the the like if you like the pre the lead up to the war. How did we so underestimate the Japanese their, their capabilities? You know the. We seem to have massively underestimated what they could were actually capable of doing. Yeah, I think, I think they did. Um, you know, it was just it was just complacency from uh, from from the HQ in Singapore and and also from from Great Britain. Yeah, I mean, you know, they had a lot a lot going on in uh, in Europe and um, the Middle East, and it wasn't a priority because they thought that the Japanese forces were not as good as they were or they you know they weren't going to do what they what they did they didn't think it was feasible but um so, zero uh, zero fighter because the um yeah. avg the um, american volunteer group or the flying tigers were sending reports back to the states about the zero yeah they counted it over china yeah um yeah i think they just looked <clears> on <throat> case the chinese and thought wow well, we could handle that it's no problem at all uh, Got that very very wrong and there again i suppose if you look at something like the burma campaign the japanese got it very very wrong yeah it's going to be a walk over it's going to be good we can do what we did in malaya not a bloody problem at all and of course they came up across the guys at kohima and infel and um basically they were told that the british troops were told by slim stay exactly where you are doesn't matter if you're surrounded form a box rather like if you like Going back to the Polonic times, when infantry is sees cavalry, it forms a square. So four box, and we'll we'll supply you by air. And the Japanese thought, well, we can live off the land. We can, you know, Churchill present us, Churchill supplies. Uh, no, it didn't work, did it? That's where it went to be wrong. And it, it, I think more of their men died through malnutrition and disease than were actually killed by the British. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then they then they tried to retreat backwards, didn't they, to um, back to Old Rangoon, and uh, Slim was smart enough to uh, have a plan that defeated them on that uh, that run as well, wasn't he? Yeah, it did very very well, I thought. That, that's an interesting study, really. That's something that I'd like to do sometime is compare Slim with Montgomery. I think that was uh, two different types of of generals, but um, you know, equally. Um, What's the word? Victorious in mm. in the tactics and because uh, I think General Slim was everybody's uncle, wasn't he? he was it was well liked and uh, but Montgomery was a bit of a, a tyrant who um, you know he, he was an oddball. Certainly, <laughs> mm. um, didn't get on with that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's certainly an area I, I find fascinating. You know, if you like the like the sort of what I call a geopolitical lead up to the war what was going on what who was doing this and that i think that's that's quite interesting that uh, i i think that that is really well the answer that we're, we're asking is is in there somewhere what why how why we misjudge the japanese hmm. yeah i've got this other book um uh, oh it's downstairs a bit like you keith i've got <laughs> I've got two libraries. I've got them all on there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's downstairs. But it, it's actually a book on them. What's that, Keith? Got two bookcases downstairs. <laughs> two bookcases in the bedroom by the side. Um, my front, spare front bedroom. Bookcases in here, my office. Bookcases on the landing. <laughs> 500 books. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was thinking people were talking about um, uh, Len Gibson's book. Because obviously it's now out of print. And I thought, oh, I'd love to have got that, you know. And I'm looking through my bookcase on the on the landing. Hello. I've already got the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that does happen. Oh, that's what I was asking for. <laughs> it's it's interesting watching these people on the news, isn't it, where they they're on a Zoom link to the to the newsroom and they, they they've got this array of books in the background, you know, it, it's like uh, <laughs> interesting to see 
if you can read the titles, who who has what, you know, and I'm sure some are strategically placed, you know, to give a an impression of um, what what their interests are. Yeah, yeah. On, on East Midlands today, when he um, does his bit from his home, you see all the books in the on the in the background. Yeah, all about politicians. Yeah. <laughs> 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 some of them you sort of think to yourself you know is this are books really yours or is it rent a library you know <laughs> <laughs> it's probably that wallpaper you can get you know that you <laughs> yeah that's right yeah well actually there's some of the some of the meetings you can you can change the background of your meeting so you don't see yeah. your house you can put it on something but just get a picture of a big library and make yourself look good you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, I was saying I've got this book um, about Operation Matador, written by um, what's it called, um, Gilchrist, uh, who was in the SOE, uh, and he, he was based in Singapore uh, pre-war, so he, he, he knew what was going on. Um, but he also had he was involved with with uh, Operation Matador, which which. Um, was on and off and on and off and 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 Churchill in the end, um, you know, it was the invasion of um, of, of Thailand really. Matador was, um, and he was told by um, uh, Percival was told by Churchill to um, well, the decision is yours, <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course you know it didn't happen for various reasons. So, but books like that, I mean, you know, a very specific. Um, operation and, and the, the, there's like lots of background information in there and, and I know it's go Christ's view but it's it's good to compare that with um, Brooke Popham's uh, report on the, on the on the on the operation and see you know who's coming from which angle and yeah, yeah. Wavell did a report as well which um, so I suppose I, I it's had... debatable well I would have actually worked I mean if See if we had sent forces into Thailand, but the Japanese landed in Malaya and they cut them off. So yeah. I suppose it's a bit debatable whether I would have actually done anything other than what had actually happened, you know. Well, if they'd have been there when they were coming onto the beach, then it might have been a different story than, uh, you know, the Japanese riding the bicycles down the, the country lanes of Thailand and Malaya. But, um, it was too late, you know. The, the decision was made too late. They didn't. They couldn't move fast enough from where they were on the border with uh, with Malaya up into uh, up into Thailand. It was, it was just too late. Yeah, because they had to get to one particular place. I think it was called the ledge. Yeah. Um, and the Japanese beat them to it. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I was reading a book that John the Moffat recommended. It's called um, the Sarong and the Chris, the Sarong and the Chris, and it's about a guy who was out in Malaya. I think he was a, worked on tin mines or something like that. And there were civilians living up on the Malay Thai border. Mm. Um, they were told, "Get out! Whatever you do, get out of here, because the Japanese are going to come across the border." And sadly, they didn't listen, and they were—they were just the Japanese just killed them. Mm. You know, that's, that's it. They weren't yeah. like a, you know, spare the men to guard them or anything like that. Yeah, which is, uh, I thought, was, you know, awful. Because he said, yeah, um, well, the way he puts it in the book was, you know, we didn't hear from them again. So, mm. Yeah. I suppose, mm -hmm. like, uh, the scene though, we're talking about the, uh, the underestimated Japanese. I mean, how much did the, the, you know, they call them like the fifth columnists? The Japanese had like the agents in earlier, uh, Singapore and places like that. Mm. The, maybe that, the information that they were getting from that, give them the advantage. We, we didn't have that, op the opposition, if like, we didn't know what they were going to do. Mm. But they knew what our dispositions were. Oh yeah, I mean there, it was. Um, there was one photographer that took, used to take lots of photos of the troops. Japanese photographer used to run his little shop in Malaya, in uh, Singapore. Um, at the surrender, he turns up in the uniform of a colonel. <laughs> and you had the what's the other one? Um, 
But somebody was taking photographs of Pearl Harbor as well, wasn't there? And you got the Japanese fishing fleet off the coast of Malaya in Thailand. And they were just, they were part of them that were there to size up. Mm. Then, similar to what we were doing on um, the beaches in France for D Day. Yeah. 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 It was uh, <clears throat> the same in Thailand, you know, this um, relationship that Thailand had with, um, with Japan. Um, there was all sorts of agreements of, swapping resources you know for education and arts and culture and engineering military so there's all sorts of japanese tourists appeared um ar ar around the um, coast around songla and patani um and, and, and they were there just sizing it up yeah yeah true mm -hmm. i remember uh, when i put up uh, i worked at this company in there were well, well, after some orders from Japan. So this, the Japanese sent a delegation to discuss this uh, order. But what they did is there was a group about, there must have been about 12 or 15 of them. And they says, oh, we've had the meeting. And then they took them onto the onto the shop floor to have a look around. And they just all just like went woof with cameras and they were all over the factory taking pictures <laughs> left, right and center. And the, the person who was like one person looking after them, he couldn't do anything about it. And they, they, they took all these photographs, didn't get the order, but what happened, they started making the same stuff. Mm. They're not tough. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, I've heard, I've heard, or oh, I think, I forget what it was, there was a, a letter or something or in, in a newspaper, but this guy worked for a Japanese company. Uh, and he said, whatever you do, don't. So you're not you're not treated with any form of respect. You're you're, you're an outsider. You're not Japanese. Mm. Totally different work ethic. He said it's it's probably the worst movie ever made. Um, yeah, but, it is difficult. It's a different culture altogether, isn't it? It's, yeah. um, I, I I had um, the opportunity to um, have a look at a job in Shanghai a few years ago, and um, it, it's very difficult to tell. A Chinese chef that um, he's going to you from now on he's going to use a an English system to order his fish from the market. You know, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yeah. different culture. Yeah. yeah. Again. <laughs> well, if it's if okay. it's uh, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just uh, stop the recording. I've got um, 